Good evening. My name is Michael Anderson, and I am the President and CEO of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. would like to welcome you to the first of our two extraordinary James C. Mead lectures that we have planned for the first half of 2021. Before we begin this evening, we would like to take a moment to remember James C. Mead, this lecture's namesake who passed away last August at the age of 93. Mr. Mead was much more than this program's namesake or even its benefactor. He was certainly the creative energy behind the Friends Lecture Series, and from what I understand, it was Mr. Mead and not museum staff who programmed the series for many years, bringing in truly extraordinary scholars to speak on a great variety of compelling topics. While all Friends Lectures will continue to bear Mr. Mead's name now and well into the future, we felt it was especially important this year to create a program that matched Mr. Mead's many art historical passions and, then, and one that would do justice to his enormous legacy. Tonight's topic, Every Eye is Upon Me, First Ladies of the United States, seems perfectly suited to both tasks, given Mr. Mead's very learned interest in American history, the presidency, the, the presidency and American portraiture. We will be uh, thinking of Mr. Mead as we delve into this fascinating and timely topic, and would like to send our fondest wishes to the entire Mead family, Virginia, their daughters, sons-in-laws, grandchildren, Mr. Mead's brother, and all of their other family members who many of whom we believe are with us today virtually. Thank you all for sharing in Mr. Mead's incredible legacy. Now on to our speaker, who is no less remarkable. Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw is the class of 1940 bicentennial term associate professor in the Department of History of Art at Penn and is affiliated faculty in Latin American and Latino studies, cinema studies, and gender sexuality and women's studies. She received her PhD in art history from Stanford and then held an appointment as an assistant art history, uh, assistant professor of history of art in African and African American studies at Harvard University for five years before coming to the University of Pennsylvania in 2005. Shah has been a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute uh, for Advanced Study and the National Portrait Gallery and has received many other top fellowships and awards for her teaching. Our speaker has a no less remarkable uh, list of accomplishments as an author and curator. Shaw's first book, Seeing the Unspeakable, The Art of Kara Walker, was published in 2004. Since then, Shaw has also worked on a series of outstanding exhibitions and catalogs, including Portraits of a People, Picturing African Americans in the 19th Century, Represent African American Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Kara Walker, Virginia's Lynch Mob, and other works in 2018. And that brings us to Shaw's 2020 Smithsonian exhibition, Every Eye is Upon Me, First Ladies of the United States, which is the source for tonight's lecture. Throughout the lecture tonight, uh, or once it is concluded, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A area for a post-lecture question and answer session. Now, please join me in providing a virtual welcome to tonight's very distinguished speaker, Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw. Thank you, Michael. It's really great to be here and to, and to have applause, applause of one heard, <laughs> heard through the ether. Um, I'm coming to everybody tonight from New Jersey, where we have lots of snow on the ground. Um, it's really great to be able to talk about this exhibition, Every Eye is Upon Me, First Ladies of the United States, um, in part because uh, nobody can see it in person right now, which is very sad. Um, the National Portrait Gallery is closed right now. I understand from my colleagues that we we should open in the next few months before the exhibition is due to close. So I have big fingers crossed um, that that will happen. Um, but I wanted to start out before I begin talking about the exhibition and the portraits and um, the women um, who are represented in it. I wanted to give you a fly through um, of the show so you can get a sense of what it looks like. Um, and hopefully that will whet your appetite um, for uh, when travel um, is, <laughs> is, is possible for you um, and you come to, uh, to Washington um, and uh, maybe get to see the exhibition. So here's our fly through.
Okay, well, I hope that has um, whet your appetite for the exhibition. Um, this was a very special exhibition to work on. Uh, it enabled me and my colleagues to collaborate with um, specialists on First Ladies and the history of the presidency from across the country. We worked very closely with the White House. We got special support, um, conservation support from the White House Historical Association. I work closely with colleagues at the National First Ladies Library, which is located in Canton, Ohio. Um, uh, we had loans from the Library of Congress, uh, the State Department, other Smithsonian museums, and then a lot of presidential sites and libraries. Um, and you can see them uh, listed here. Many, um, uh, uh, you know, many earlier presidents, they, they don't have libraries. There are sites mostly in houses, but you'll notice that there aren't any first ladies sites um, or <laughs> libraries. And this really points to one of the, the key issues that um, became really apparent to me as I began to work on this exhibition is how marginalized our first ladies have been, despite the fact that they are right there, you know, the, the right hand of the seat of power um, in our country, um, their legacies and their histories remain largely unknown uh, to Americans. One of the things that I always loved doing when I was um, uh, a teenager and I would go to uh, Washington DC was to go to the Smithsonian's American History Museum where there's a wonderful exhibition, permanent exhibition of First Lady's um, inaugural ball gowns um, and uh, China um, that was associated with their time in the White House. Um, and I was always intrigued by that because it gives you a very immediate sense of who these women were, you know, what they what they looked like, what their dress size was, how they liked to set their table, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively small um, exhibition um, in, in terms of that museum, which is quite large. Um, and at Portrait Gallery, this exhibition is a very large one, um, but it's really the first time that we've ever done something like this. And I, I was struck by that. I would have assumed, and many of our visitors assume, that First Ladies have a much more prominent place at the National Portrait Gallery. As a matter of fact, that's the one request um, that uh, we used to get back in, you know, back in real life when you would go to the museum and people would fill out their comment cards um, on their way out, they would say, where are the first ladies? And America's presidents, of course, are very well represented at portrait galleries. There are a number of very, very large galleries devoted to the presidents. Um, and we have a book um, America's Presidents um, that focuses on them. So in doing this exhibition, we wanted to also do a book, an evergreen book that was not specifically associated with the exhibition, but could always stand on its own. Um, and so we've done that in this First Ladies of the United States book, which is um, uh, a, a really great overview of uh, the portraits that are in the exhibition and then also in the collection of the portrait gallery. And it was remarkable to me to learn just how few of these first ladies had formal portraits made. And so I want to give you an example to start off with an example of a first lady who is really very unique um, in the history of portraiture. And that's Julia Gardner Tyler. And it is from her that we took the title of the exhibition um, from a letter that she sent to her mother um, in which she wrote to her, I very well know every eye is upon me, my dear mother, and I will behave accordingly. Now, you might ask why Julia had to tell her mother this, why her mother was uh, slightly concerned, because you look at this portrait of her and she looks you know, quite the princess. Um, very, uh, very refined, beautiful, young, this uh, gorgeous silk satin um, uh, with, uh, you know, very kind of lacy overlay, um, diamonds and pearls, you know, absolutely resplendent. Clearly, this is a young woman who was born into great wealth, great privilege. Um, she was born on Long Island uh, out near uh, East Hampton. Uh, her family owned an island called Gardener's Island on which she was raised. They still own that island. Um, it's the second largest uh, privately owned island in the United States. Um, and so she really came from a very well-heeled background. So when we see her posing for this picture, for this portrait, this painted portrait, 
we see somebody who is very comfortable um, in that position. But she came from uh, uh, she, you know, as 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 young women are wont to do, she came from a situation where she had kind of stepped outside of the boundaries um, that had been set from her set for her. And uh, this happened when she posed for this advertisement, which we also feature in the exhibition. This is a broadside advertisement um, that ran in Manhattan um, for a uh, uh, for a store, um, a, a kind of middle brow department store um, along uh, that little cartouche that you see at the center near where her handbag might be. It says, I'll purchase at Bogart and McCamley's number 86 Ninth Avenue. Their goods are beautiful and astonishingly cheap. Well, this was this was just awful for her family. Um, and you might say, well, how, how did they know it was her? Um, her nickname was the Rose of Long Island, and it's put across the it's across the bottom, that inscription with the rose, the Rose of Long Island. And she was so well known as, um, you know, the most beautiful young debutante on Long Island that this was enough to give it away that she had posed for this advertisement. And what was even worse was that she's posing with a strange man. <laughs> and nobody knew who this guy was that she was walking down the street with. But then again, it's a drawing, right? It's a print that's made from a drawing. Um, but that's the 19th century for you. So in 1840, this was a big scandal. Her family whisked her off to Europe. They, um, uh, she had to do the grand tour um, so that the, uh, uh, the, the gossip would die down about this scandal. She met the Pope, all sorts of things. And then she came back to New York and um, pretty shortly thereafter, she went to Washington DC with her father, David Gardner. Gardner had been um, a Senator from uh, New York and he was still very well connected. And one day they were on um, a ship, the USS Princeton, which had just been launched. And um, there was a demonstration of a, of a gun, of a cannon called a peacemaker. And you can see from this print that there was a terrible explosion and several people died. Now, Julia Gardner was not one of the people who was injured. She was below decks flirting with the newly widowed uh, president of the United States, John Tyler. Um, and uh, unfortunately, her father was one of the people who was killed. And President Tyler comforted young Julia. Um, the two fell in love. It was a real May-December uh, romance. Um, she was 24 and he was 54. Um, but uh, apparently they were very compatible, nothing creepy about it in the end. Um, and they, uh, they had many children together and developed a very, very um, close relationship. And their family, actually one of their grandsons, their family were very long lived and one of their grandsons is actually still alive, believe it or not, it's very interesting. Um, so marrying John Tyler brought Julia Tyler into um, the world of the Southern aristocracy. Although she had been born in New York City, in New York, uh, uh, in New York State, while that state still had slavery, um, uh, until she was seven years old, her family owned um, enslaved people. Um, and then afterwards, she benefited from the labor of the formerly enslaved. So it was very easy for her to slide into um, the life of a Southern slaveholding family. And she felt very empowered, in fact, after she had been um, first lady. Um, uh, she was in the White House for several years and it gave her a real voice. During that time, just after this, just after her time in the White House, she had the portrait by Anelli made. It was reproduced um, as a print, which you see up at the top. Other portraits, like the painted one of her at the bottom, as well as early photography, like daguerreotypes, the one that I show you on the right, um, were made of her. So she's a first lady who's very well documented. And she was very outspoken. Um, you know, clearly from <laughs> from her early days stepping out in that ad, she was not shy. And she's the first American woman, white American woman, wealthy, white, southern slave holding woman to make the argument publicly um, about slavery in the South as being beneficial for African Americans and enslaved people. Um, she writes a letter, an open letter to the Duchess of Sutherland um, in England. Um, the Duchess was uh, a big um, uh, anti-slavery activist and uh, Mrs. Tyler 
tells the Duchess off and she says, you don't understand how it is in the South. We take care of our people. We take care of our slaves and we're very good to them and you need to butt out and mind your own business. Now, today, wow, it's just awful to look back and to think that the first first lady to publicly speak out in this way is arguing on behalf of something as reprehensible as the perpetuation of slavery. But it's interesting to think that for this woman, she had been given a voice. She had been given a voice that other women, white wealthy women in the United States did not have at that time. And she felt empowered to make her argument. Um, however we view it today is, is different than how she felt in that moment. Um, she had such visibility and such power. Uh, and it, it when I began to learn about Julia Tyler, I was really stunned by these contradictions, thinking about the history of women in the United States, women like her, and how few remnants, how few relics we have, um, few images, objects associated with even the first ladies to think about the role of women in the United States during this time. So she's a very interesting example to start with. Um, Harriet Lane Johnston, this is another first lady, one you think last name, Johnston, Lane, you know, we didn't have a President Lane, we didn't have a President Johnston. Well, many of our presidents were either predeceased by their wives or their wives died while they were in office or they were never married or they married after they came into office. They needed to have a woman in the White House to serve as a hostess for formal events. Anytime there was a, uh, a mixed gender gathering, there had to be a female hostess there along with the president. And so many presidents relied on female relatives, female um, friends of the family to fill that role. And Harriet Lane filled this role for her uncle James Buchanan. Um, she's an especially interesting um, woman in this role because of of the way she's represented in the exhibition with this portrait bust, with the sculpture bust. This is the only sculpture that we were able to include of a first lady. She's the only one who had one made of her. It's done in beautiful marble. It shows her uh, her fashion choices. This, you know, this very low cut um, dress. She was notorious for having lowered, uh, lowered ha having had her inaugural ball gown lowered two inches, which scandalized people. Um, you, you get, you're catching a theme here, aren't you? That, you know, many of these first ladies really kind of went out on a limb fashion wise. Um, and she was a big art collector. Uh, she commissions this bust of her by uh, William Henry Reinhardt, and she also gives her collection of art to the nation um, around the turn of the century. She donates all of her paintings and sculpture that she owns, that she's collected over the years, to the Smithsonian, and they form the basis of the National Fine Arts Collection, which is now the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So we're in indebted to Harriet Lane Johnston for that, but it's also interesting to think about the way is that she saw herself, again, empowered like Julia Tyler, um, to kind of have a voice. And here she has one in the memorialization of her own um, uh, appearance. Now, I start with these women and these questions about multiple representations, single ones, different media, because the National Portrait Gallery has only been commissioning portraits of first ladies since 2006. We started with um, this portrait of Hillary Rodham Clinton, um, and it was in order to kind of fill these gaps. This exhibition does not have portraits of every first lady because some do not exist. Margaret Taylor, for example, Zachary Taylor's wife, no known portrait of her is extant. We don't know what she looks like. We represented her in the exhibition um, with a portrait of her daughter, Betty Taylor Bliss, uh, because of that. And so it's been very important for um, the preservation of our nation's history to begin to make portraits like this one um, of, uh, of Mrs. Clinton. Um, and uh, people ask, you know, how do these portraits get made? How did the artists get chosen? Uh, just an interesting footnote here is Ginny Stanford, um, the, the, the painter who made this portrait, is from Arkansas. 
which tips you a little bit to how um, some of the choices happen to get um, uh, artists who have some affinity and some understanding of where um, the First Lady and uh, the President are coming from. Now, many folks know these two portraits, uh, which were first exhibited in 2018 at Portrait Gallery. They more than tripled the, um, uh, the, the annual admission to the museum. They've been very popular. The portrait of um, uh, uh, Mrs. Obama is in uh, the exhibition. And just down the hall is the portrait of uh, President um, Obama. And these are, oops, these are super interesting um, because of how much they step out of the box for historical portraits um, of first ladies and presidents. And I just want to differentiate for a moment here um, the portrait gallery portraits and the White House of portraits. So when we talk about official portraits being uh, commissioned for the portrait gallery, we're, ones, we're talking about ones that come into the Smithsonian. There's also another set of portraits which gets made um, that go into the White House. And so for this exhibition, we've combined those two. So we have portraits from the portrait gallery collection and from the White House and then from all of these other presidential um, sites. And you can see in looking at these at this comparison um, with George W. and Laura Bush's uh, portraits that the ones at Portrait Gallery allow for um, you know a, a, a little more informality. Um, you know, rather than wearing a suit and tie, President Bush is in a camp shirt. Um, uh, Mrs. Bush is in the private quarters uh, reading a book. Looks like she's just been interrupted as you come into that uh, that living space there. Um, whereas the official White House portraits are indeed much more formal uh, and represent um, the president and the first lady to all of the heads of state, to people who visit, uh, visit the White House. And that was another reason why I really wanted to work on this exhibition because it's so hard to see these portraits now. And I think after um, the events in uh, in January with the insurrection at the Capitol, it's going to be even more difficult for people to see portraits that are at the White House. Um, you know, since 9-11, since 2001, it's been very difficult um, to see uh, these spaces. So bringing them um, uh, to the public in this way was, was hugely important to me. Um, so I want to talk about uh, a little bit more in depth about one of our early First Ladies, Dolly Madison. Not only did she serve as First Lady for her husband, James Madison, but she also did so for Thomas Jefferson, um, who was unmarried while he was in the White House. He had been widowed um, very early. Um, and uh, she was very social. She enjoyed throwing parties and she really was very um, focused on how, how she looked. She was born a Quaker, so she always covered her head. And you can see she has this bonnet um, on her head, which um, it's sort of like a turban slash bonnet. Um, she has these beautiful brown curls, which are peeking out from underneath it and earrings and her cheeks have been rouged. Um, even though she was well into her eighth decade of life when this painted portrait by Elwell um, was done, she's still trying to, you know, look her best. She has not, uh, you know, skipped skipped a beat in that. Um, right down to those curls, which were not her own. Um, you know, today we might color our hair. I, I'm, I'm sporting some pandemic hair <laughs> right now. Um, but we might color our hair. Well, she wore a wig and the bonnet, that turban, was one of the ways that she kept the wig um, on her head. Now, if you were able to come into the galleries and look close up at the portrait, you would see that her blue eyes are a little cloudy. And so here Elwell has, has you know, even pointed to, um, uh, you know, the cataracts that, um, that were coming on um, in her advanced age. And I love being able to juxtapose this painted portrait with a daguerreotype, um, very early daguerreotype from 1848 from Matthew Brady's studio. Brady, of course, very, uh, very important photographer um, in uh, in the middle of the 19th century, does a lot of Civil War 
um, era photography. Um, and here we see uh, Madison with her niece, Anna Payne. And it's great to think about this revolutionary generation, um, a woman who was born before um, uh, you know, 1776, before the American Revolution, and yet survives all the way to the dawn of photography. So not only do we have her in a painted portrait, but we have her in photographs. Now at Portrait Gallery, we love to talk about Dolly Madison and the Lansdowne portrait of George Washington and, um, uh, and, and how she saved it um, from the British when they came to burn down the White House. Uh, during the War of 1812, when they showed up at the White House in 1814, and she whisked it away. And um, we've been revising that story over the years. Now, the Lansdowne portrait exists in three different versions. Um, two of them are copies, but they're all really quite equal in their excellence. One is in the White House, one is at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and uh, and the, the story goes that Madison knew that the British were coming. She knew that they were going to burn down the White House and she did not want them to capture this portrait lest they burn it in effigy, right? Lest they destroy it as a way to destroy the body of the president. And so she called to her servants, um, uh, free servants and enslaved ones, and she had them get up on a ladder, take it down, take it out of its frame, roll it up and whisk it away. Well, we see that Dolly Madison saved the portrait, the Lansdowne portrait, but scholars are revising this to acknowledge the role of um, enslaved and working class people in saving this with her. Um, you know, she, she was not climbing that ladder, I'm just saying, <laughs> but it was her forethought. She understood the power of portraiture and the power of representation. Um, and she passed on much of this knowledge to other first ladies like Sarah Polk. Um, Polk is the only first lady never to have had children. Um, as a result, she was very um, free from the labor of raising children to attend to uh, business uh, with her husband, James K. Polk. Um, and she was super interested in politics, just as, as Dolly Madison had been. Dolly Madison came out of uh, retirement, sort of. She returned to Washington after living in the country for some years, um, a few years just before uh, Sarah Polk arrived. And she reached out to the new first lady to give her tips about how to get by in Washington. And they became very, very good friends. And you can see that friendship in the way that Sarah Polk is presenting herself to us here in this portrait. She has a bonnet on her head that is very similar to the one that Dolly Madison wears. She has this tassel that comes down over her shoulder and she styled her hair in those same ringlets. And I really see this as a way that she's giving a kind of sartorial nod, you know, a little bit of a thank you to her political mentor and to the woman who taught her how to navigate the politics of Washington. Thinking about women in the 19th century, I, you know, I mentioned how um, how Julia Tyler found her voice as odious as it was. She found it and she was able to use it um, uh, with women uh, in the White House, women who served as first lady, wives of presidents. They had a great deal of what today we would call soft power. The receptions, um, the dinners, the uh, the state dinners that they presided over were spaces where a lot of business got done, whether it was business across the aisle um, or uh, uh, international business. Um, and many of these women were very, very focused on politics. And this brings me to the next first lady that I want to talk about, who is Mary, uh, Mary Lincoln. And I want to talk about her through a garment. In the exhibition, we have four garments. Now, I had mentioned um, uh, my great love of the Museum of American History and the first lady's gowns there. I didn't want to try and compete with them. <laughs> so I chose garments for the exhibition that had not been seen in Washington since they were first worn. And this is one of them. This is a very delicate object. It's a capelet. It's a short cape um, that Mary Lincoln um, owned. And you can see there's a, uh, a repair on the back where the lace has been patched. Um, this capelet um, was made for her by Elizabeth Keckley. 
Keckley was a seamstress or a modiste. Uh, that was the term used at the time in Washington. Um, she had a shop. She had been born into slavery in Virginia. She was owned by um, her own half sister. Um, and uh, she sewed in her spare time and she earned enough money um, to buy her own freedom and that of her son from her sister. And she set up a shop in Washington and, and became the modiste to all of um, uh, the wives of famous uh, Washington politicians, including Mrs. Lincoln. And she developed a very, very close relationship with Mary Lincoln. If you've seen the film Lincoln, um, uh, she's dramatized um, in, in that film as Mrs. Lincoln's companion. Um, now, this is a relationship to, you know, today we think, oh, they were friends. Well, you know, it, it was not a, a, a relationship of equality. Um, you know, I, I like to say, I, I love my manicurist. I, I go and see her every two weeks. We're very chummy, but you know, there's a power relationship there. This is a service relationship. And so we have to keep that in mind um, when we think about the friendship that Mary Lincoln had with Elizabeth Keckley. But you can see this inscription on the bottom, and that was what I had turned up um, on, uh, uh, on the dress, uh, on the capelet in the case, is this inscription. It says, um, to Mrs. A. Lincoln, um, gift of E. H. Keckley. Um, this this capelet is made out of ecot dyed silk, very expensive fabric with this very very delicate hand lace handmade lace overlay, and this was a gift in 1861. This is just at the start of Mrs. Lincoln's time as first lady, but Mary Lincoln loved clothes. She would go to Keckley's shop and she would, you know, at the start of the season, um, she would go and she would order 12, 14, 15 dresses to be made. So Keckley was making a great deal of money off of Mrs. Lincoln. So she's throwing in a little sweetener <laughs> to the pot um, by adding uh, this capelet. And um, Mary Lincoln is one of these first ladies that we just do not have strong visual representation of um, in the fine arts. Um, and when I say it that way, I mean painting or sculpture. There are many photographs of her, including these um, small paper carte de visites. She loved to have her photograph taken in the clothing that Keckley made for her. And many people talk about um, Mary Lincoln. She, in the 19th century, she got an incredibly bad rap as a difficult woman, as being crazy. Her son had her committed to um, an asylum for a period of time. Um, and I really believe that this is because she was a very, very smart woman and very ambitious. And she had no outlet for that ambition. Very early on, she finds a man who will take her where she wants to go, Abraham Lincoln, to the White House, equally ambitious, and she goes there with him. However, this is very frustrating for her. And so she pours a lot of that frustration into shopping. You know, today we would call her a shopaholic. This was like one of the outlets that she had. Now, after Abraham Lincoln died, she was pretty much destitute. Lincoln died without a um, without a will, so all of his money went to um, their surviving sons. And so she was dependent on her son um, for an allowance. And she had not she was had not been used to that. And so it was very difficult for her to live within those means. So at one point she and Keckley plot um, a sale of her clothing to raise awareness um, of her plight. Um, and this is at a moment when um, the widows of presidents, even the widow of a president who was assassinated as, as um, Abraham Lincoln was, um, received no pension um, from the government. Um, this changes by the end of the 19th century, um, but there was no other way that she could really raise this awareness. Um, and as I said, there's no painted portrait of Mary Lincoln. Um, there was one <laughs> that was uh, uh, discovered in the 1920s, um, but it turned out later uh, to be a fake. Um, and that's just how much the desire for um, representing um, first ladies, you know, is there that, that fakes have actually been floating around for some time. Um, so in addition to that garment, we included three other garments in the exhibition because of the ways that they enable us to talk about um, the portraits and the lives of um, these first ladies. Now, Portrait Gallery is a, um, 
an art museum and a history museum. So we're always kind of doing double duty. And it's been very important to me um, uh, in my time there to talk about, you know, why this portrait, why this object, um, not just who um, is in the portrait um, or who is connected um, to the object. So in, um, uh, so I want to just like go into these three, these three garments and the first ladies they're connected to. Um, the suit that we have by um, uh, uh, by Shannon Non. Um, Shannon Non was a, um, a a dress shop, a, a, a bespoke dressmaker um, in Manhattan in operation um, through most of the 20th century. And it was the favorite spot that Jacqueline Kennedy would go to to get her garments made. When she came to the White House, we can see her here in a portrait made for the cover of Time magazine. Portrait Gallery has the Time collection, um, which are all of the cover art, all of the cover art made for Time magazine through the um, uh, through the the late 1980s when they stopped commissioning um, portraits um, and uh, artwork um, for the uh, for the magazine. So this one was done in 1960, um, and it was to to celebrate this young and beautiful first lady coming into the White House. Jacqueline Kennedy was just 32 years old um, when she came to the White House. She had two young children in tow, um, and you can see that little um, uh, uh, pram um, on the portico behind her, representing that young family that she was bringing in. And she brought so much glamour with her um, after, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to uh, knock Mamie Eisenhower, but Mamie Eisenhower um, was not nearly as glamorous as Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, and one of the ways that Kennedy maintained uh, that, um, uh, that reputation for, um, for being highly fashionable was by continuing to wear French designs when she came into the White House. Now, she was wearing American-made French designs because she had a relationship that was so ironclad with Givenchy and Chanel that those fashion houses permitted their designs um, to be sent over. They would send the patterns over, the fabric, even the buttons um, for, uh, for their designs. And then Chenin Non would sew them for Mrs. Kennedy. And in this way, uh, Mrs. Kennedy could say that she was wearing American made clothes and yet have this international style that charmed people around the world. And we have her to thank um, uh, for the Mona Lisa um, coming to visit the United States um, and also for the establishment of the White House Historical Association and the preservation of many of the objects and the spaces and the furniture within the White House. This was one of the chief things that, um, that she accomplished um, while she was there. And there's a fantastic interview and tour that she does, which um, I which you can watch on YouTube, um, and it'll give you a sense of um, how she moved through that space. Now, the second um, gown uh, or the second garment. So we have one suit, um, we have a capelet, and now we have this um, marvelous um, uh, uh, beaded gown that Nancy Reagan wore to the second inauguration in 1985. She actually wears this gown twice, and I show you the second wearing of it was when she received their Royal Highnesses, Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now, if you are of a certain age, like me, you will remember this night when Princess Diana danced with John Travolta. Totally blew my mind. <laughs> I was so, like, I was a big Lady Di fan. What can I say? Um, but Nancy Reagan's gown that she wore that night was spectacular. Um, it had been designed by James Galanos. It's absolutely covered in rhinestones and beads. When we were mounting um, this gown onto the mannequin, and I was working with the uh, the textiles conservator. We took it out of the case, and it just like lit up the room. And um, I said, "How much does that weigh?" And they they hefted it, and they said, they said about twenty pounds. And I thought, "Oh my gosh!" Because Nancy Reagan was just a little teeny slip of a thing. She, you know, was just a little bit over five feet. Um, you know, she couldn't have been more than. Yeah, I mean, I think she was probably less than a hundred pounds dripping wet, and yet she was able to carry off this, um, this, this really incredible gown. Um, and 
Nancy Reagan was an important figure to represent um, in terms of her self-presentation and her in the sartorial strategies, the clothing um, strategies that she used um, while she was first lady. She had been an actress in Hollywood, so she was not afraid of the spotlight, and she always wore red when she had the chance. Sure, she wears other colors. We can see her here in this white gown, but red becomes her signature. Reagan red. Um, it becomes a very ubiquitous color, so much so that it becomes the color of the Republican Party. Um, and, uh, you know, now we talk about red states and blue states, and this really goes back to Nancy Reagan's um, choice of red. And political scientists um, argue a little bit over this, um, but we really can see um, a very direct line um, coming from her. This is another portrait on the, on the left that's from the Time Collection. This was on the cover of Time magazine um, in 1985, um, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the title on the cover was White House Co-Star, um, and you really got that sense um, of the glamour that Nancy Reagan brought back into the White House. I have to admit, I had forgotten how much people hated Nancy Reagan um, in the 1980s, and this kind of brought it back, brought it all back for me. Um, so an, another controversial first lady in some ways, Michelle Obama. We really wanted to um, bring the Millie gown, um, uh, which is actually more of a sundress. It's kind of a, uh, a maxi dress um, uh, that she wears in the portrait. When I went to visit the designer, Michelle Smith, um, who has since sold um, the company Millie, um, she now has her own eponymous uh, brand, Michelle Smith, New York City. Um, and uh, she took uh, one of the, the runway versions out of the closet to show me, and I was stunned because I didn't realize that it was made out of cotton poplin. Now, cotton poplin is a fabric that most of us have in our closets. It's very accessible fabric, inexpensive. Um, this is printed, uh, printed cotton, um, and the patterns on it um, are reminiscent of um, American and in particular African-American um, quilting traditions. And this is a direct um, link that the designer made. She had been, excuse me, she had been enamored of uh, a quilt show um, that traveled the country, the G's Bend um, quilts um, from a quilt making collective in Alabama. Um, and she really wanted to think about um, how these women had used fabric um, to make patterns and to think about women's work and women's labor. And Mrs. Obama was drawn to this dress when it was presented to her by her stylist as she was preparing for um, uh, the portrait commission to be done um, by uh, artist Amy Sherald. Sherald was also drawn to the dress and they agreed that this would be um, you know, an excellent choice. And we can see from um, uh, uh, the picture of the dress on the runway here and um, uh, the slide that I showed you of it in the galleries that it really looks a lot like the one in, um, uh, in the painting, you know, but it's been made into something that is really much grander, the way it's been spread around Mrs. Obama. Um, it makes her very monumental in form. Um, you know, there's this pyramidal, you know, triangular shape that the skirt helps to form and she really fills uh, the space. Now, there's been a lot of different criticism of, um, of Cheryl's portrait. Some people have remarked on the skin color um, of Mrs. Obama um, that, you know, why is she gray? Um, and Cheryl has talked about her purposeful graying, um, taking away, um, uh, uh, making, uh, uh, making African-American sitters skin gray as a way to draw emphasis away from race, away from skin color, in order to focus more on, um, uh, on uh, the person being represented and what you can glean from the representation other than um, the color of skin. Um, another interesting thing about the portrait is the way that Mrs. Obama is taken out of time and out of space by being set against this plain blue back background, which is reminiscent of the sky, sort of like a celestial um, blue background, which really makes this um, into a very timeless um, image. Now, I'm, uh, the last thing that I want to um, share with you from the exhibition was a real treat for me, which is a 
we have a slide presentation of portraits of First Ladies by Annie Leibovitz. Many of these portraits were made for Vogue magazine and Vanity Fair. Um, Leibovitz, of course, is you know a, a fantastic um, uh, journalistic photographer, um, but she's also an amazing editorial photographer. And these fashion spreads that she's done um, of women um, like uh, Mrs. Obama, you can see um, Mrs. Bush, uh, Mrs. Laura Bush um, down on the lower uh, lower left in the same gown that she wears in her official White House uh, portrait. Um, and Leibovitz also, um, uh, she's photographed every living first lady, um, including um, uh, Betty Ford, um, who you see over there um, on the left. Now that one, that picture, of course, along with the one of um, Nancy Reagan in Reagan Red, um, those were taken after um, the first ladies had left uh, the White House. But it was great to work with Leibovitz and to make a choice of photographs. And we have them running um, in, a large display in the galleries. So I'll wrap it up there um, and we'll go to questions. And well, Michael, thank you. Yeah, you're going to feed me the questions, right? It, it's me, Brian, and I'm from the sound oh, booth. OK, great. Now I can see you. The whole time I had Michael's face on the screen, so I could see him nodding, which was very nice. <laughs> I was looking for his nod. OK, Brian, let's do it. We have a few questions, and as a reminder to all of our viewers, um, please click on that question mark if you have additional questions. Um, we have a few from the audience already. Um, you mentioned earlier the um, Lansdowne portrait. There were three copies. You mentioned the location of two of them. Where is the third located? Um, I believe it's in a private collection. That's usually the answer. <laughs> In another question, um, referring to Mary Lincoln, 15 dresses seems like a lot for a single season. Was that typical for a first lady of her time or was Mary Lincoln a fashionista? Mary Lincoln was a serious fashionista and she was very, um, uh, you know, very particular about about her garments. Um, and I, you know, I should say something about these two that you see here. There's there's one garment which is very spectacular. It's called um, it's like the dress of 400 flowers or something, and uh, it's at the American History Museum and it's covered with these little rosettes. Um, and in uh, in in the uh, in the in in the carte de visite that's in the middle there, I guess we'll call it, and um, where she's all in black, she's in mourning attire. Now it was, um, uh, she had four sons, two of them died. One of them died in, uh, you know, in the White House. This was very um, traumatic for her. Um, and, and yet we see her having a photograph taken in mourning garb. Well, that's because mourning attire in the 19th century was hugely expensive. To dye fabric black was very, very expensive. And so to have a whole wardrobe of a year's worth of mourning clothes in black was a way to demonstrate your wealth, your affluence, um, and the respect that you had um, for those you had lost. And so not only did she, you know, wear these incredibly expensive clothes, um, but she wanted to make sure everybody knew that she was wearing them. So her love of fashion was um, was partly for herself. It was a way for her to express herself. It was a way for her to be seen um, and for her to, you know, be at the center of attention. Um, and and you know, and this was part of why she develops this, you know, this very bad reputation in Washington. And people see her as very pushy. Um, and, uh, you know, and kind of loud and um, ostentatious. Um, and, you know, I, I really think that it, it, drew, it grew out of this frustration um, that she had. And as a, um, you know, as a woman who came from an elite background, her, her family were um, uh, uh, slaveholders in Kentucky. Um, she, uh, she had always, you know, wanted she had wanted to be heard um, and ultimately she could only be seen, you know, and this was one of the way the one of the ways that she did it. Thank you. Another question. We haven't heard anything about Abigail Adams or Martha Washington. What can you tell us about them? Loads. 
So in the exhibition, we have a um, fabulous portrait of, um, of, of Martha Washington, um, which is uh, based on the Athenaeum portrait. Uh, portrait Gallery owns the Athenaeum portraits. This is, these are, this is double portraits um, of, um, uh, of Martha and George Washington. Um, uh, we co-own them with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, and, uh, and the portrait that we have um, in the exhibition is, um, is, is a copy of one of those. Those portraits were made specifically designed to be copied multiple times. Um, and Martha Washington, her portrait is, is very, very interesting because it ends up many places where you would not imagine. Um, for example, there's a, um, uh, uh, there's a print in the collection of the Portrait Gallery which shows the first 10 presidents um, in a circle, little, little circular portraits, and then the middle is Martha Washington. And it's as though like somehow she's connected to all of them, like she's everybody's first lady, which she wasn't. Um, but she really is viewed as the, you know, the mother of the nation, just as um, George Washington um, was viewed as the uh, the patrie pater, as the father of the nation. Um, Martha Washington, you know, also um, has that status. Abigail Adams, we have a fantastic portrait of Abigail Adams that um, was on loan from the Fenimore Museum, um, and it shows her wearing a, a great um, uh, uh, shawl that would have been imported from India. Um, the pattern of it tells us that, and it, uh, it, it points to her cosmopolitan style and her interest in being connected um, to the global trade in goods that um, was you know, very vibrant in the 18th century. Um, we also have her represented in a small silhouette, a cut paper silhouette, um, alongside one of her daughter-in-law um, and fellow first lady, Louisa Catherine um, uh, Johnson Adams. Um, and those two silhouettes are inscribed at the top with the names of the women um, in the hand of John Quincy Adams, Abigail's son and Louisa's husband. So um, we have them represented um, also. And Abigail Adams, of course, you know, a very interesting um, first lady. She, uh, uh, she wanted, you know, people ask, why are they called first ladies? And this is a term that was really settled on um, late in the 19th century. People called Martha Washington Lady Washington um, because that was the culture, the you know the the culture of the gentry that um, uh, our nation was coming out of. Um, and Abigail Adams, she's like, I don't want to be called Lady Washington. Call me Mrs. President. Well, people didn't like that. <laughs> they were like, that's that's not right. We're not sure what we want, but we don't want that. Um, and she was very. You know, she 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 had a very strong you know sense of self possession, and she had written to um, uh, to her husband while he was helping to draft the Declaration of Independence. She said, "Don't forget the ladies. Um, you know, give women rights." Well, he forgot, um, <laughs> and she never really let him live that down. But um, very very interesting women those two. Next question: How many first ladies have portraits? Um, well, so in the exhibition, we have 55 different first ladies represented. Um, some people count 57, um, and in, in, that, uh, in, in, in that tabulation, they're including two women who hosted like one party at the White House each, and so we, we scratched them from the list. Don't tell anybody. Um, but so we have 55 first ladies represented. And so that's wives of presidents. And then again, you know, nieces, daughters, daughters-in-law who, who served um, in that role. And um, uh, the only one we do not have uh, represented is, is Margaret Taylor. But, you know, I was really struck by the fact that there was not a painted portrait of Mary Lincoln. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned that earlier because the, um, when this uh, charted up fake, um, it was a portrait of another woman that had been painted over so that the face looked like Mary Lincoln and a brooch um, had been put at her um, on her chest that was a miniature portrait of Abraham Lincoln. 
It appeared in um, in the 1920s um, before the death of, of her last son, um, and it was a way that um, the forgers um, could, you know, really play on that desire to have a representation of Mrs. Lincoln. Um, and they attached a, a marvelous story to it that said that, you know, she had commissioned it in secret. She was going to give it to the president on his birthday, and she had just finished sitting for it when he was shot in Ford's Theater. And so she never gave it to him, right? And that's why nobody knew it existed for, um, for uh, 60 years um, and or 50 years. And, um, you know, this was really, I mean, this pulled at people's heartstrings and it was displayed in the State House in Illinois and then later at the Lincoln Historic Site. Um, and it, it, was, it was there until 2012 when it was cleaned um, and they discovered that, uh, that the brooch was really a, a cross <laughs> and that it wasn't her face and, you know, all these awful things. Um, so we have 55 First Ladies, but some of them are represented in photographs um, uh, as is actually the, the most recent, the last First Lady, Melania Trump. Um, she's represented in a photograph um, that was delivered to us, framed and ready to go from the White House. That's the official White House portrait of Melania Trump. Well, sadly for all of us, our time is up. Thank you to our guest speaker and lecturer, Dr. Gwendolyn DeVoy Shaw. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. For all of those attending, I want to remind all that we will have a recording of this presentation available only to those who attended or registered for the event. And please visit OKCMOA.com for more upcoming programming. Thank you. <laughs>